Uh, how many of you uh, participated in the Kong Boot Camp yesterday? Okay, good. So I'm guessing that most of you, uh, how many of you would say that you're comfortable working in Kong? I'm not going to assume that. Okay, a few. Good, good. Uh, so, uh, as you'll see, uh, the purpose of these lectures is to sort of keep developing your skills and probably give you some more foundational background in uh, logic and then uh, probably not in the first lecture or two, but we'll uh, develop uh, um, some programming language semantics in talk and try to show you uh, how that plays out um, so that you can connect uh, the foundational material sitting here with the other lectures you receive throughout the summer school. Um, so, but to start, I wanted to, um, to kind of give you a little bit of background and the fragment of of the summer school that I'm going to be talking about is software foundations. And to begin with, I wanted to really drill down a bit on the foundations aspect and put some of what we'll be talking about in the summer school into a little more of a historical context. Um, I also know that uh, yesterday you were divided up into teams, so feel free to, uh, to cheer as the story develops. Um, so where I want to begin, actually, is uh, quite a while back, um, the story of Gottlob Frege. Uh, <laughs> Fre team Frege. Uh, you may know or may not, uh, he was a German mathematician who started doing geometry but got very interested in logic and the foundations of arithmetic. And way back in 1879, he uh, published uh, a foundational text. Um, my German is terrible, but it's the Berichtschrift. And but basically, it was it, it's the concept script. It's um, uh, the subtitle was "Formal Language of Pure Thought," modeled on that of arithmetic. And it was from this book that we get. Um, much of the notation that we use in logic today. So he was the first one to introduce things like the turnstile, a symbol for negation, and most importantly, um, the notion of quantification over hypotheses. And so this was really the first notation that was able to expre express sort of arbitrarily, compli arbitrarily complicated um, logical formula. And um, so he spent quite a long time and quite a bit of his energy developing um, this foundation um, for arithmetic. And he published um, several other volumes along the way. Uh, in 1884, he published a volume of the Foundations of Arithmetic, and then two su subsequent volumes on the basic laws of arithmetic, uh, where he was basically trying to isolate the logical principles, um, conjunction, disjunction, existential universal quantification, <coughs> apply them to arithmetic and derive all of the sort of arithmetic facts from first principles uh, to put math mathematics on a very solid mathematical foundation. Um, but of course, uh, some of you may know that the, the plot thickens at just this point. So uh, after 30 years of work, and in fact, uh, Frege went, invested all of his own fortune into the, um, into the hand engraved plates that were needed to print the special notation he had come up with for these logical volumes. He spent essentially his whole, um, his whole fortune on invested into these books. Uh, and just as the second volume was going to print in 1902, you can see it came out in 1903, he got a letter. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that letter was from a guy named Bertrand Russell. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and among the many things that Frege had contributed was this notion of a set comprehension. Um, so you're all familiar with the set of x such that p of x, right? We use this notation all the time today. But in his logic, you could write down um, the set of y such that y is not in y. Um, sets and objects were sort of all intermingled. And uh, Bertrand Russell um, noticed that you could then uh, create a set x such that y, uh, you know, the, the set x is the set y such that y is not in y, and then ask the logical question, does that set contain itself? And this, of course, leads to the famous Russell paradox, 
and it completely destroyed his logical foundation. So just as he was putting this uh, into print, he got this letter from Russell, and in fact, the very last thing he did was add a final page um, as an addendum at the, in the 1903 printing, which said, hardly anything more unfortunate can befall a scientific writer than to have one of the foundations of his edifice shaken after the work is finished. This was the position I was placed in by a letter of Mr. Bertrand Russell just when the printing of this volume was nearing its completion. And so basically, um, he had spent all of this time and effort, uh, and there was a bug. And a pretty severe bug, because um, it basically made his entire logic inconsistent, and therefore you couldn't really trust any of the conclusions um, about arithmetic. Um, so what was the, the aftermath of that? Well. Frege actually came up with a fix for his logic, but it turned out that his, um, his fix, it was kind of hack, and it made the logic trivial. So you could, it, it basically you couldn't do anything useful. And um, it was up to Russell uh, to kind of make better progress in trying to attempt to fix this logical inconsistency. And in 1908, he developed what um, began developing the theory of types, where you sort of se separate um, universes of types, so you can avoid these paradoxical sets that contain them sets themselves or, or don't. And uh, this is what eventually led, uh, in the next few years, um, to the, the famous book, Principia Mathematica, um, Whitehead and Russell's famous uh, treatise about axiomatic logic and uh, formal mathematics. And so this, you know, was for the first time um, a consistent, it was thought, um, uh, approach to formalizing all of mathematics, but uh, had one little problem, which was that it was a tiny bit um, unwieldy. So uh, you can see uh, that you know there are things like, from this proposition, it will follow, when we encode arithmetic in the right way, that 1 plus 1 equals 2. And this was on page 379 of <laughs> So it was sound. Um, <laughs> but not exactly the kind of thing you wanted to do in your day-to-day -day, um, logical reasoning. Um, but, you know, uh, many, uh, logic was an active, uh, uh, very active in this time, and over the, the next few years, in the 30s and 40s, there was a, a really uh, quite an uh, amazing amount of progress in terms of logic. So, in the early 30s, we have Kurt Gödel. first proved the completeness theorem, and then his uh, first and second incompleteness theorems. And this basically demonstrated that any consistent formalization uh, capable of expressing piano arithmetic uh, cannot be complete. So uh, there, are, there are statements that are true, but you cannot prove them uh, using the logic. Um, so this was a tremendous advance, and it was seen as sort of the, the fact that, uh, it, I like to think of it as the full employment theorem for logicians, right? Because there are true things that we can't prove, but we can always get a step further by changing the logic, right? We can, we can you know, continue to change the logic and um, make more expressive versions of the logic. Um, but, you know, there are many other alternatives as well. Uh, other highlights from the 30s. Well, in 1936, Gensen uh, proved the consistency of arithmetic. He introduced the notion of sequent calculus and a process of uh, cut elimination that lets you prove consistency of um, logics, and it's still the uh, kinds of techniques that we use today. Uh, in 1936, Church introduced the lambda calculus as an alternative um, formulation for uh, many of these logics. And also in 1936, you can see 1936 was a big year for logic. Turing uh, came up with the idea of Turing machines and uh, proved that uh, the decision procedure for facts of arithmetic and piano arithmetic are undecidable. And uh, this led to you know, his uh, characterization of the famous halting problem. And uh, just as an interesting side note, side note, he didn't get his PhD until 1938, two years after he came up with all these amazing things. So uh, for those first year PhD students, no pressure. <laughs> have a couple of years to become Turing. Um, and then in 1940, uh, Church introduced uh, the simple theory of types, um, which is sort of uh, the first way of 
characterizing Russell's type theory in a syntactic, um, in a syntactic setting. Okay, and then we jump forward um, to 1958 and 1969, where Haskell Curry and William. Yeah! <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think that there are only four teams, right? <laughs> uh, it sounds like it sounds like Curry made the smaller team on some of the other side. Um, they observed this remarkable correspondence um, after you know looking at um, Church's simple type theory that you can see this um, correspondence between types and propositions, programs and proofs, and computation as a notion of simplification of those proofs. And we will um, spend a lot of today's lecture actually sort of unpacking the consequences of that in terms of the modern day facilities of the COP. Uh, but I'm just trying to sort of um, see where all this comes from. And in fact, this was a very fruitful uh, notion, and through the 60s all the way up into the 80s, um, de Brown uh, exploited this in the Automat project, which was um, you know, trying to use this curry howard correspondence for computer verified mathematics. And that's sort of the, the um, intellectual uh, an ancestor of all of our modern um, type based theorem provers. And you can see uh, the 70s was another great. The early 70s was another great time period from the point of view of logic and programming language because here we have Girard introducing system F, the polymorphic lambda calculus, uh, and then F omega in 72. Martin Loff introduced uh, intuitionistic type theory, which is a, uh, we'll see quite a bit about. Um, it's the foundation for many of the dependently typed uh, programming languages, including Koch and the other uh, dependently typed um, systems that we'll, you'll get to see uh, during the summer school. And um, as a testament to the kind of universality of System F, um, John Reynolds, completely independently of Girard, discovered, um, rediscovered System F in 1974. And I think it's pretty um, uh, interesting to note that you know, these discoveries in the 70s about basic logic are what underlie the type systems for modern programming languages like OCaml and Haskell and um, even the richly dependently typed languages um, that are currently you know, in vogue in academia. But um, you, know, you could argue that Apple's new Swift programming language owes a lot of its intellectual history to the developments in logic in the 70s and earlier. Uh, but we're going to not stick on the programming language uh, leg of this history story. We're going to um, veer down the fear improving uh, path. And so in 1984, uh, Terry Cochan and uh, Gerard Huey began uh, to implement Koch. So that's quite a while ago. This is um, uh, so they started implementing the first version uh, 30 years ago, and um, in 1985 they introduced the calculus of constructions, which was a combination, in some sense, of Martin Locke's intuitionistic type theory and um, uh, Girard's f omega, uh, and that's. That core, uh, in fact, inductive uh, variant of that is what forms the kernel of Koch that we'll be um, exploring. Um, and that uh, calculus of inductive constructions, which is basically extends that earlier work with a built-in notion of inductive data type, um, uh, was developed in 1989. And sort of the history from then has been many, many versions of, uh, of Koch. I put a few of the notable um, uh, releases here. So in 1992, that's when Koch was ported to Xavier Loire's uh, CAMEL language, which is the you know, predecessor of OCaml and this, all of the subsequent versions. And even today, Koch is implemented um, in OCaml. And uh, we're using uh, the modern Koch version 8.4. <coughs> in the summer school. I'll have a little bit more to say about the kind of mechanics of the um, cock that we'll be using then. Okay, so that's sort of a whirlwind tour of the, the foundations um, part of this, um, uh, of this series. What about the software um, angle? So suppose, uh, maybe like Frege, uh, 
you've invested a lot of time and effort in something. Uh, you know, he put 30 man years into his uh, books about foundational logic and sunk all of his life savings into these plates for uh, you know, printing the books that he had spent so much time. But suppose you, know, you work for a company, maybe not you independently, maybe your team has invested 30 years in developing some next big thing. It could be the flight control software for the next, uh, the next big airplane. It could be you work for Google and you're building an autonomous vehicle navigation software. Or you know, maybe in five years or 10 years, we'll be developing gene therapy uh, that's you know, tailored to individuals based on um, the, the genetic analysis of the, their DNA. So suppose that you spend all this time and effort on some great new thing, and you have a lot of resources at stake, and maybe you stand to make a lot of money. Um, how do you avoid getting a letter like the one that Frege got from Russell? A walk on your box. Yeah, maybe you don't want to get any letters, or maybe there's a, a worse consequence. Is Frey was actually kind of lucky that Russell found the bug, in, or you know, found a bug in his development and pointed it out, so he could you know, do the scientifically, um, intellectually honest thing of admitting that there was a problem. But if you were worked at a company and you didn't find the bug, and all of a sudden you know your airplane crashes. Um, that might be even worse than the discovery of the right? So nowadays, we're going to try to set the same, you know, put software on the same kind of strong foundations um, that logic is, uh, is set on. And of course, the problem of reliable software is not a new one. And there are many, uh, many approaches to doing that. There's a whole spectrum, in fact, um, you know, ranging from the very social uh, kinds of mechanisms where most companies have uh, coding standards for the software they're developing, and they have code reviews, or they use methods like pair programming, or stream programming, or test-driven development, uh, that are all intended to improve the quality of the software. Uh, and you know, those things are great, but they're a little bit less formal. Uh, it's easy to miss things. And you can imagine having uh, tool support in sort of increasingly rigorous degree. So, you know, glitch or debugging tools, um, code uh, testing version, um, uh, sort of automated testing suites like you have in, in Haskell, for example. Um, and you can also imagine moving all the way to you know, mathematical proofs that the software exhibits a particular kind of practice. So um, I like to think of software reliability as a spectrum. And of course, um, this is not really a trade-off. You should be doing all of the things that can make software um, more reliable. And of course, um, there are different costs involved with each of these different methodologies for trying to improve your software. And so you need to, uh, you need to sort of balance the cost against the, um, the result. But in, in some cases, you can make the argument that formal mathematical proof is justified um, for, the, um, for the software. But you should realize that even in the most formal cases, you still have to be careful that you're proving the right thing, or that um, your assumptions that you make, and they're always going to be assumptions, actually match the reality. So um, this, uh, this segment of the summer school, software foundations, and in some, to some extent, um, the summer school as a whole is going to be about various intertwined threads that um, weave uh, tools from logic um, for making precise claims about software or programming languages in general. Um, threads about using proof assistance, and we're going to look at Coq, but you can think of a compiler as a proof assistant. You'll look at other, um, other techniques for doing machine checkable um, analysis of programs or proofs of uh, properties of programming languages. Um, We'll, inter we'll sort of interweave this thread of functional programming um, where you know, it's a method for programming uh, and also a bridge between programming and logic because of the curry harvest and morphism. Um, and we'll look at some techniques for formal verification. So in this uh, segment, we'll look at uh, how to formalize a simple imperative logic and the basis of something called for logic, which is a style of reasoning about those imperative code. And in other, um, other uh, 
course of the summer school, you'll see sort of how that plays out in richer, more complicated set settings. For example, when Andrew Pell talks about um, his verified uh, uh, his logics for program verification, and all of this um, is founded on the use of type systems, uh, which are derived from logic um, to make this uh, to give us guarantees about the program. And of course, there's a natural question about all this: is given the potential cost, uh, can it scale? So of course, we know that. Um, Many programming languages, and most uh, programming languages that are sort of um, widely used for industrial applications that aren't web-based, scripting-based, uh, have st strong static type systems, right? So uh, Java, Swift, C, C Sharp, these sort of things. Uh, and e even in the scripting sort of web language uh, area, there's a trend toward making more typeful uh, programming languages, and that's because static guarantees are good. Um, so types play a crucial role throughout all of programming languages, but we're going to, uh, in this, this particular segment, look at COC and whether program development using uh, interactive theorem proving and proving properties of software can scale there. And it turns <coughs> out that even though sort of using theorem provers is on the bleeding edge in some, in some respect of um, uh, programming language research, there are a lot of good exemplars about how well this technology can scale. So probably the most um, famous is uh, Xavier Loire's Comsert project, which uh, basically is a fully verified C compiler implemented in, in Coq. But there are many others, for example, um, the Why Not project from Harvard, and uh, I already mentioned Andrew Pelzer, verified software toolchain. Um, John Schall's uh project at Yale, and I've done some work uh, myself on something called a, a formalized LVM IR. Um, There's a Bellum project at Penn. So I want to just um, take one slide and give you kind of the high-level picture about how these sort of things play out, um, and I'll use Bellum since that's the one that I'm uh, most familiar with. So Bellum is this. Uh, Verify LVM, and the details aren't particularly um, important for the point I want to make. But uh, the LVM IR, you might know, is uh, it's an intermediate compiler representation um, that is open source, but sort of funded by Apple. They use it in most of their uh, compiler infrastructure products. So their Xcode tools use the LVM. Uh, so if you run iOS, you're pretty much compiling through the LVM, but it's used in lots of other places in academia. Uh, and what the LVM infrastructure gives you is a way of taking source code from lots of different programming languages. Typically, uh, it was originally designed for C and C-like languages, and compiling it um, in stages um, to some target platform like the iOS uh, devices. And um, the key thing about uh, the way the LVM is structured is that many of the transformations that the compiler performs are at uh, the LLVM intermediate representation. So it's sort of a source to source translation. And this is great because we can apply programming language uh, semantics techniques to give a formal model of what it means for a program in this LLVM intermediate representation to compute. And that gives us a formal basis for comparing, for example, whether an optimization is correct by looking at the, you know, the semantics of the program before and the semantics of the program after and making sure that they're somehow equivalent. Uh, so what does this let us do? Well, um, we can build on top of the LLVM a formal semantics in COC. And of course, we're not going to um, go into the details of how this would work. And the Software Foundation segment will give you sort of a taste of how you do this for um, a very simple imperative programming language by the end of the, by the end of this lectures. But basically what we do is we build a model of the, uh, this intermediate representation. Uh, it's a programming language, so we define an operational semantics. Uh, we define uh, some syntax and some means of working with this programming language. We have to give a particular memory model and uh, you know, there are details about what the semantics of the instructions in this programming language mean. But we make them perfectly formal in COC. And then we can do things like uh, write down program optimizations using the COC, using COC as a programming language. 
and from that, um, extract a program. So this is directly using the Curry Howard isomorphism where we write down uh, uh, some, some cock uh, formalism. Uh, in particular, we can do things like write an interpreter, for example, which is one way of defining a semantics uh, in Kopp. Extract it to an executable program. Um, it, it extracts through OCaml. And with a little bit of engineering work to patch the bindings together, we can essentially extract a verified transformation of this code. Right, so this is, gives you a flavor of the kind of thing you can do. And the theorems you can prove is that you know, the, um, the resulting uh, output of this transformation gives you the same um, observational behavior as the input program, for example. And this similar kind of um, stage transformations is what underlies um, CompServe, for example. Okay, so does this actually work? Uh, well, there's a great paper. I don't know uh, how many of you have seen this paper before, but it's a, a really, uh, if you're interested at all in compiler correctness, uh, there's a paper by John Rager and his group uh, about uh, testing C compilers. So the way this, uh, the way this research worked was uh, they have a random test case generation, and there's a lot of fascinating research that goes into how you generate good test cases for compilers. Uh, you generate random source programs that stress various parts of the C compiler. You run the code through the compiler and you do this kind of cross comparison to look for differences in the outputs uh, with different optimization level, levels and so on. And in doing this, uh, if you're clever, you can find lots and lots of bugs in modern compilers. Uh, they looked at lots of you know, GCC, LVM, and so on, and they found many hundreds of bugs. Um, the great thing is, uh, at the time, Comcert, this was in 2011, Comcert um, was available, and they, they found fewer than 10 bugs in Comcert, and all of the bugs were in um, some parsing code that was in the sort of unverified front end that was hard to put into Coq. And in fact, since then, Xavier's group has fixed that. They now even do parsing in a provably correct uh, manner. But the reason why I like this paper so much is it has this great quote, which uh, says, you know, the striking thing about concert results is that the middle end bugs we found in all the other compilers were absent. As, uh, as of early 2011, the underlying, uh, the underdevelopment version of concert is the only compiler we have tested for which C. Smith cannot find long code errors. Uh, and this is not for lack of trying. They devoted six CPU years to the task of finding bugs. And the apparent unbreakability of CompCert supports a strong argument that the developing compiler optimizations within a proof framework, where safety checks and explicit machine check uh, are, uh, are explicit and machine check has tangible benefits for compilers. So this is great, right? If you're a programming language researcher or interested in doing compiler verification, if somebody outside of the you know sort of peer improvement community gives you this kind of uh, assessment of your work, you're doing well. Okay, so um, that's sort of the motivation and background about why we want to study um, software foundations uh, in, in Kotkin. In, um, and so what, what does the software foundation do? Most of you um, were at the <coughs> camp yesterday, so you know that the software foundations is this uh, textbook that's available online. I'm assuming all of you, uh, most of you have uh, downloaded it and started working through the exercises. Um, in this uh, set of lectures, I'm going to try to uh, get through uh, the up to and including the um, imp parts of the software foundation book. So that's the imperative programming and poor logic reasoning. Um, that means that we're going to leave out some things, but the book uh, is, decide, you know, is designed so that you can work through uh, exercises on your own. Um, and it's, you know, the book itself is set up as a tour through a kind of um, introductory functional programming, which is what the boot camp yesterday um, was uh, supposed to cover. And I'm going to pick up um, with the logical foundation, so more about the curry Howard isomorphism and how we do logic in Kopf. That will be the rest of uh, this morning's lecture. And then we'll move on to things like how you model programming languages um, by defining operational semantics and um, giving um, principles for reasoning about software in Kopf over the next few lectures. Um, we probably won't get to uh, type systems. Um, another, besides doing all that kind of program verification work um, that I just uh, 
highlighted. Um, there's another trend in programming language research, which is to do meta theory results, like type safety proofs for programming languages using theorem provers. And we probably won't get to that um, in my set of lectures, but you should think about that and continue on in your own, uh, you know, you should be well placed to do that. And think about how the things we're doing in COC connect to the other lectures that you see here at the summer school. Um, okay, good. So that's sort of my, my introductory spiel. Um, I should say, please, uh, I'm now going to shift into a mode where we're kind of working through examples in COC and talking about the way COC works. And um, I want you to, uh, I realize that many of you uh, have only seen COC for maybe a day or so. Uh, how many of you have, would consider yourself fairly expert in COC? Good. <laughs> Okay, so you can help the other people. I don't know, um, did Michael present this uh, challenge problem that we that Andrew Appel put forth? Okay, so if you feel like you're bored by my lectures, don't, uh, don't, I won't take offense, but you can go work on that. Um, for the rest of you who are not, um, maybe not so comfortable in COC, please um, slow me down, ask questions. Um, if you don't remember what some command or something is that I'm using, please let, you know, let me know. I want you to learn. Uh, yeah. Do you know if there is a group of people working on this challenge? Problem? I don't know. Yes, so, so, I don't know. Yeah, yeah they are actually outside. Okay. Um, we started yesterday. We set up a tutorial call. We got working so people can join. We had a project we can branch off to various parts of the problem. Uh, so, yeah, I was just waiting for you to finish this tutorial. Great. Yeah. Outside, so Good. Okay. Okay. So actually, this would be the perfect time uh, to do that. So anyone who wants to go work on the challenge. Uh, now, in the meanwhile, uh, I just wanted to give you some pointers. So you all know already that we're using the Software, software Foundation's um, book, which is available uh, on the web. Uh, if you are interested in pursuing more things about COC, you should definitely uh, take a look at, um, well, Interactive Peer Improving and Programming. That's the COC handbook is very useful. But also, um, out of Paula's uh, Certified Programming, uh, independent types really it's sort of a natural follow-up to the software foundations material. It assumes more um, more background. Um, here we're going to be using talk 8.4. You already have the web pages. I'll be using, I'll be switching into proof general. I'll be using a combination of proof general and sort of um, HTML5 versions of the software foundations uh, notes. Uh, you do not have to follow along, you know during lecture, if you can, if you can try if you want. Um, but really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of walk you through step by step, and then the, the book is structured, as you've already seen, in such a way that you should be able to um, work through the exercises independently. Also, um, the last session today is an interactive hands-on session, and uh, for my part of the course, uh, the assignment is just to keep working through the, um, um, the talk material in Software Foundations. I'll try to stick around and you know, be available to help you. You're free to work in groups or however you feel is useful. Um, um, okay, that said, um, if you try to get into talk, I feel like this is sort of the impression you get maybe after seeing it yesterday. Um, there's uh, a lot in talk, uh, and in fact, it has um, a very rich dependently typed programming language. There's a whole tactic called LTAC. Um, there are various libraries and packages, uh, and so you sort of get overwhelmed. Um, we're going to start, and you've already seen this in the boot camp yesterday, <laughs> something more like this. Very little automation. Um, in fact, automated, as we go through the next uh, few lectures, I'll introduce you to some more automation because it becomes really essential when you try to scale up the proofs. Uh, and really, kind of the goal at the end of my four lectures is to move you from like this to maybe something like this in terms of the way you interact with color. Uh, and then sort of from there, you know, I would certainly not even consider myself an expert at this level. Um, I always have to look up LTAC notation, and I'm terrible at debugging LTAC tactics. So uh, uh, yeah, so don't feel overwhelmed. We're here to help and, um, and have fun. Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to quit the PowerPoint at this point. Um, let me switch over here. So, uh, 
So, okay, so uh, I chatted briefly with uh, Michael Clarkson last night, um, but I wanted to quickly remind you of the sort of things that you've been seeing you should have had a little bit of a taste of yesterday. So I know it was probably uh, being thrown into the deep end, but um, you saw a bunch of sort of functional programming and some basic tactics um, in Coq. And just to, uh, if, you, if you look at the Software Foundation's book, there's a file called More Coq, which is sort of the end of the functional programming um, part. And at the very end of that is a review of all the tactics, which is handy as a reference um, in case you, you forget. Um, I'm going to roughly um, assume that you've seen these, but again, please feel free uh, to interrupt and ask me to remind you what we've, uh, what we've done. Um, instead, I'm going, to, and I'm going to pick up with the file um, logic. Uh, logic.v. So this is the, uh, the part of Software Foundations where we switch from doing functional programming and learning some basic tactics to thinking about how you implement logic uh, in a theorem prover like Kong. And I think this is a very natural starting point for the Software Foundations uh, lectures because it's sort of where the curry howard isomorphism uh, and programming in Kong uh, meet. Uh, okay, so before I go on, are there any questions or you know um, any sort of uh, comments about how to get started? Okay, like I said, please, this will be more this will be more fun if you're uh, if you're interactive. So, uh, as a recap um, and maybe a reminder if you haven't really grokked this about Cox yet, uh, Cox logic. Um, is bu built on the calculus of inductive constructions, and it's actually a very tiny core foundational um, development. So what do you 